Good morning and welcome to the Dorothy Lay Hospice. My name is Dipti Prabhu and I'm the Executive Director. Before we begin, please join me in acknowledging the land on which we are gathered. The Dorothy Lay Hospice and the communities we serve are located on the traditional lands of several Indigenous nations, the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is governed by Treaty 13 and by the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, which is an ongoing peace agreement between many Indigenous nations to share the land, taking no more than is needed, leaving enough for others and taking care of the land for generations to come. So I'd like to warmly welcome all of you uh, here today, members of the media, ministry staff, our valued healthcare partners, members of our board of direct directors, our staff and volunteers. A warm and special welcome and thank you to the Honourable Deputy Premier and Minister of Health, Sylvia Jones, for joining us today for an important health care announcement. Before we start, I'd like to share briefly a little bit about the Dorothy Lay Hospice and the work we do. For over 30 years, the Dorothy Lay Hospice has served the community of Etobicoke, West Toronto, and East Mississauga. Together, our te dedicated team with our volunteers and partners serve over 2,000 people a year, providing compassionate palliative care that addresses the physical, medical, emotional, and spiritual needs of people at the end of life and their families. This care is provided in our residents and in people's homes. The ribbons that you see behind me and the postcards and the dots on the map represent individuals that we have served and honors the lives that they have lived. Hospice palliative care is about compassion, caring, and dignity. It's the type of care that we would all want for ourselves and for our loved ones. There's a growing need for palliative care, and we are so incredibly proud to work with our community, our healthcare partners, and our local Ontario health team to integrate care, to connect care, so those that need palliative care can access it easily and that it's available for everyone. I'd now like to invite Ulrike Davis to the podium to share a little bit about her experience with palliative care. Thank you. Good morning, staff and visitors. As you know, I'm Ulrika Davis, and I have been invited to say a few words about the Dorothy Lay Hospice and how it helps their clients and members of the community. Our experience with the Dorothy Lay Hospice goes back about 30 years. <sighs> My husband, George, and I participated in many fundraisers through our church when the Dorothy Lay Hospice was just an idea. Yes, we are now standing in the middle of a success story. A few years ago, after our tour of the hospice, George made the decision that if necessary, he would spend his final days here. Little did we know that on October 16, 2020, in the middle of COVID, my George would be a resident. Our experience was indeed warm, welcoming, and friendly. George had kidney cancer and would travel to the doctors at TGH and palliative care. Support became very difficult. His files were transferred to the Dorothy Lake Hospice. All the staff, doctor, nurses, personal support workers, and volunteers that cared for my George were loving, caring, and very compassionate. They treated him royally, and he loved to chat with them and hear their stories. That is, when he was awake. To make us feel at home, even in the middle of COVID, on three warm days when George was feeling well, we had outdoor dessert and coffee visits with friends. The staff wheeled his bed out into the patio. I brought dishes from home. Guests brought Tim Morton's coffee. Yes, Dorothy Lee really did want us to have a comfortable home-like experience. After the passing of a loved one, there was a hole in our heart and life. I, like so many others, participated in the bereavement classes offered by the hospice staff and volunteers. I personally found the loss of a sp sp spouse support group very healing. The weekly OASIS meetings were and are best for me, and I still participate in that one. One-on-one -on -one is difficult. However, being in a group allowed me to come to terms with what I was experiencing. It is a safe place 
to share your most difficult moments. I was not alone. It is okay to cry, be angry, be happy, etc. No one judges you. You are ju just loved and accepted where you are on your journey. From these meetings, many friendships are built. We understand and support each other's. Some days are easier than others. There is comfort in the community environment. Now, as a volunteer receptionist, I am one of the first people that a visitor meets. It is at this time that a smile and a friendly hello is so important for family and visitors Oops. coming to visit a loved one. These are not easy visits. I also experienced the many calls inquiring about the care available in the residence and services available to members of the community. Finally, the procession when leaving the hospice is done with such dignity. Staff line the corridor and a fi final farewell is shared. Loved ones leave by the front door to a van, not a funeral car. So much thought has gone into the process and my family and I are forever grateful for the dedication, love and care by everyone involved in caring for my George and all their clients. Thank you. And now I would like to invite the Honourable Minister, Mrs. Sylvia Jones, to the podium. Thank you. Well, well Rika, thank you for sharing your story. And uh, thank you for taking your experience here and transferring that into volunteerism. It's wonderful to see. So good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here at the Dorothy Lee Hospital. On behalf of Premier Ford and our entire government, I would like to thank Dipti, Donna, and the entire team here for your work to deliver compassionate care to people. I also want to thank our healthcare workers who work in home care, hospice, and paramedicine, who provide care to Ontarians in community every single day. Last week, we introduced Your Health, a plan for connected and convenient care, a path that focuses on providing people with a better health care experience by connecting them to more convenient options closer to home while shortening wait times so you can receive the care you need faster. And one of these critical initiatives is connecting people to convenient care at home so more Ontarians can choose to stay in their homes longer as they age. The only thing better than having care close to home is having care in your home. We have heard loud and clear from Ontarians that they want better and faster access to home care services. Delivering convenient care at home provides a better experience for people and frees up more spaces in hospitals, long-term care homes, and doctor's offices. And you deserve the choice to connect to care in your own home or in your own community instead of a hospital or a long-term care home which is why our government is investing over $1 billion in home and community care services over the next three years to support the almost 700,000 families that connect to home care services annually. This funding will help more people connect to the care they need in the comfort of their own home by hiring more workers to deliver a wider range of services and ensure home and community care services can recruit, train and retain staff to keep pace with our growing aging population. We are also working with Ontario health teams and home and community care providers to establish new home and community care programs because your home care plan should start and will start as soon as you step foot in the hospital or other health care setting. And your convenient health records will follow you as you move between providers. We are also continuing to expand the role of community paramedicine, which is already connected to more than 30,000 individuals in 55 municipalities with 24-7 non-emergency services. Paramedics work tirelessly to help those living with chronic health conditions stay at home longer and avoid unnecessary trips to the emergency department. So an elderly so an elderly person who just needs a reminder to take their medication as prescribed and on time is no longer making a trip to the hospital that could have been avoided. These changes will also allow paramedics to refer and connect people to local community care services, such as home care or hospices. 
Ensuring Ontarians have a choice about where they spend their final days is another key initiative highlighted in the Your Health Plan. That is why we are working to expand palliative care services in local communities and are adding 23 new hospice beds to the 500 beds already available, just like the ones here at Dorothy Lay Hospital, so that Ontarians can receive comfort and dignity near their communities and loved ones at the end of their lives. Whether it's an emergency in the middle of a night, a problem that's been bothering you for years, or you are elderly and need someone to help you with your daily activities. No matter where you live, we want to connect you to more convenient care, both at home and closer to home, because after all, it is about your health. Thank you, stay well. All right, we'll now begin to take questions from the media. If media present could try their best to line up behind me at the scrum mic. As a friendly reminder, it's one question, one follow-up. Please say your name and your outlet before your question. Morning, Minister. Liam Casey with the Canadian Press. Um, will you take the health care offer uh, from the feds? So I have had some conversations with the Premier about uh, the meeting yesterday. Um, look, there is no doubt that any new health care spending and investments uh, we will accept. I will say that I do have concerns about the timelines. You know, we are building um, a health care system for generations to come. And when deals come from the federal government in 10 and five year increments, it makes it very challenging. Whether you're looking at new uh, medical schools, new residency positions, uh, training and hiring new nurses, those are all things that take literally decades and will be a commitment of our government for decades. So yes, we are pleased that the federal government has come to the table, uh, but I will say that I, I have to look at the long term and I do get concerned when we see these 10 and 5 year deals. So does that mean you'll, you'll take the offer as is but then try to get more or try to expand the timeline? So we are meeting with uh, Minister Duclos and, um, on, uh, tomorrow, on Thursday, to uh, get further details on how we can ensure that these are not short-term, one-and-done uh, programs, that we have the ability as a government to plan for these long-term investments that, frankly, we are making. You know, I've said many times, we have spent, since 2018, an additional $14 billion in healthcare in the province of Ontario, and that's separate and apart from the COVID spending. So we're making the investments. As I said, I'm pleased that the federal government has come to the table and are, and are uh, having conversations, but I do continue to be concerned that when they are in short increments, it makes it challenging for us to do the planning that we need to do for the longer term. You know, 50 new hospital builds or expansions, uh, those are not for 10 years. Those will be available and uh, serving the people of Ontario for decades to come. Hi there, Lorenda Redekop with CBC News. Um, what is it that you most want the money to be spending it on? What's missing most? Uh, patience, patience, patience. So when we look at the investments that we are making in the province of Ontario, it is to ensure that those individuals who are trying too hard, frankly, to access service and are waiting too long have the ability to get that faster. So any investments that we make, you will see, they often tie into how does the patient experience uh, improve and how can we make sure that people are not waiting for the necessary services that they need. Yesterday, the financial accountability officer once again raised a concern that your government isn't spending enough of the money it already has and is, you know, socking all this money away. And one of those areas is specifically the health ministry that he mentioned. So how can you be asking for all this money from the feds when, you know, your own uh, financial accountability officer says you're not spending enough of the money that you have? 
So again, I will reiterate, since 2018, $14 billion of new health care spending are happening in the province of Ontario and, frankly, across Canada. You know, when I met uh, in November with the FTP, Federal Provincial Territorial Partners, uh, health ministers, they were all talking about how they were shoring up and expanding health human resources, expansions of hospice, hospital beds, um, community care. So we're making the investment in the province of Ontario and I, I understand that the financial accountability officer looks at a moment in time but we you will see through the estimates process that in fact the investments are happening and will continue to happen because we understand that is what people expect and deserve. Hi Minister Dustin Cook with the Globe and Mail. Just wanted to follow up on that question then so the FAO is saying that the government is underspending $5 billion over three years in health. Are you going to commit today to spend that amount of money if, if that is deemed to be required? So the funding has been earmarked, and as the spending occurs, then the reimbursements happen. But I can assure you, you know, when you look at uh, the 50 new additional hospital builds that are happening, whether those are brand new facilities, expansions or renovations, those are in process. Of course, the money flows as is appropriate when the builds are occurring, um, but the money has been earmarked. When we expand the access to residency positions, that is money that has been set aside and will be used for those positions. So. As, as I've mentioned previously, the FAO is a moment in time that looks at a snapshot. We are looking at the entire fiscal and saying, how do we ensure that hospitals, hospice, community care, uh, primary care, all have the ability to expand and have the money throughout the year? And we're doing that work. On the federal deal, uh, wondering what you would like to see specifically in a bilateral agreement. You said that patient experience is the goal. What, what would you like that money to go towards specifically? Well, frankly, I was a little surprised that there wasn't more focus on community care and home care. Um, to me, it is a very natural place for that patient experience to be improved and enhanced. We know that the vast majority of people, whether they are aging in place or recovering post-surgery, often have a component of their treatment where they are, are at home needing less care but still needing important care as they recover or age. Um, I was frankly surprised that there wasn't more interest and conversation from the federal government on the home care piece. Uh, hi, Minister Rob Ferguson, Toronto Star. So since the federal offer wasn't as uh, generous as the provinces and territories were hoping, um, presuming you do accept it, um, it, it seems to me that you're going to have to prioritize things maybe a little more sharply than you would have if there was more money in the deal. So I am wondering, what do you think has to be at the, at the pointy end of the stick when you start getting the money and spending it? Like, for example, would it be primary care because it's the kind of the foundation of everything else, making sure people get good primary care? Well, I think you'll see from the investments and spending that we have already made since 2018 that we are focused on making sure that people have access to that primary care physician. You know, in the Your Plan that was announced last week, uh, we have an additional uh, set of funds set aside for 18 new family health-based clinics. Why do we do that? Because we understand that clinicians want to work with each other to best serve their patient, whether that is a mental health worker, working with a physician, a nurse practitioner, um, et cetera. We see those teams being a very effective model for the patient. So the expansion is in the works. Uh, Again, I will say the federal money will assist in, frankly, a lot of the investments and enhancements that we are making. You know, when we look at adding uh, 23 new hospice beds in the, in the province of Ontario, that is an opportunity for families and individuals to have a loving, engaged, focused opportunity for their last days. And I really think that those types of investments are our focus on patient first. How do we improve that outcome? And just uh, changing the subject a bit, 
apparently there has been an investigation into leadership abuses at Trillium Partners uh, Healthcare, the hospital in Mississauga. Apparently there is a report that has been done, but your ministry is not releasing it. Uh, where is the report? Why has it not been released yet? When will it be released? So as it is appropriate, for that public information to happen. We will make sure that individuals who have been served uh, at Trillium Health Partners and in Mississauga are well served. I will say that under the current leadership, uh, I am very confident that the investments that we are making in Trillium and the staff in Trillium will continue to be a very important piece for uh, primary care, hospital, and patients in Mississauga area. Yeah, hi, Minister. Randy Rath from CHCH. Um, I'm going to ask you a local question about the Welland Hospital. Um, they're supposed to have a 24-7 emergency ward operating out of that hospital. On February the 27th, that they're not going to be able to do emergency surgeries at that hospital after 4 o'clock in the afternoon or on weekends at all. Uh, does that make sense to you? You know, it's a long way to Niagara Falls or to St. Kitts where there's other hospitals that can do surgeries. Randy, it's always a concern to all of us when we hear that our uh, local community hospital is not able to provide uh, all departments available 24-7. Very much a concern. I, I certainly appreciate how that can be uh, something that we need to focus on. Uh, Ontario Health, I have to say, and the leadership of Ontario Health works very directly with those local hospitals and local issues to say how can we assist, how can we uh, match um, physicians or, uh, or other healthcare professionals to ensure that those closures happen uh, in a very short period of time or not at all. Um, the work continues and it just speaks to the investments that we need to make in health human resources. We need to have more professionals, more clinicians available to be across Ontario. And that work, uh, some of it can happen very quickly through uh, the licensing process that we directed the College of Nurses and the College of Physicians and Surgeons to do in August. And we have seen uh, a large increase in the number of licenses that were given in 2022 as a result. But some of the uh, issues are going to take longer, and that is the things like the Learn and Stay program that we now offer for paramedics, lab techs, nurses who wish to practice in the province of Ontario and train in the province of Ontario. We're covering their tuitions and their books, and that has made a historic change in how many people are applying for those programs. But those take longer. And, that, and we will continue to do that work. There also appears to be a chronic problem down there of, of offload times and, and, and paramedics sitting around. They sat around for 33,000 hours last year waiting to offload their patients. You know, is there a quick fix for that? Something has to be done, does it not? We have been doing some work on that. Then the 911 program uh, actually allows paramedics to make determinations upon the approval of the patient uh, to take them to somewhere, some other appropriate facility that is not an emergency department. So, very specific example: if it is appropriate and the patient agrees, uh, then they could take them to a hospice. They could take them to a mental uh, health facility. Those programs are now operational in in 55 communities uh, why you ask are they not province-wide because it is an application based as the communities uh, see the capacity and the ability for their local paramedics to do this type of work then they apply and they get approved very quickly through the Ministry of Health thanks for that. and this will be the last question in mind for the emergency top up to the Canada Health Transfer that we understand is to deal with immediate issues. So surely you have some plans for that that don't require some negotiation. So what we have been doing and we will continue to do is find where there is access and existing capacity because those are the fastest ways that we can get whether it's new hospice beds online, new hospital beds online, uh, looking at the communities that have uh, the most need for primary care physicians and focus on those areas so that we make sure that we start to see an equity lens um, ensuring 
that people have that access. There is uh, some work that has already happened. Um, well, I will highlight uh, Dorothy Lay's hospital, uh, hospice, my apologies, um, two new beds are now online. Why could that happen so quickly? Great leadership, of course, but also capacity within the existing structure. Some of the other investments that we are making will take longer because you're looking at new builds and you're looking at expansions. On the emergency funding, though, isn't it supposed to go to places like, I know that pediatric hospitals were mentioned in particular to help deal with some, some pressures there. So we've done a lot of that work. Um, in November, when, uh, we, as we were planning for the pediatric surge, uh, we were able to add additional uh, bed capacity in Ottawa, for example, at CHEO. Uh, again, where there is existing capacity and they just need some additional investments, uh, we're, we have been a partner and we'll continue to do that work. All right, that concludes the media availability. Thank you, everyone, for coming.